you saw the very best players the entire country has to offer, and you saw it throughout the course of the weekend. He's growing, he's improving at such a rapid rate. He, he's going to be a very good player. This guy's a cross between Sean Marion and Lamar Odom. He's a six foot eight lefty, a high level athlete, but also got a little bit of point forward skills in him as he can handle and pass the ball extremely well. At this point, they are simply the standard by which everyone else is judged in prep school basketball. He's considering the likes of Michigan, North Carolina, Kentucky, Kansas. Welcome back to the Upside Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Finkelstein, and this week we are very excited to have University of South Florida head coach Brian Gregory here with us. Coach, I hope uh, hope this finds you uh, healthy, and, and thank you so much for making the time. Hey, great, to, great to be on, and it's uh, another beautiful day here in Tampa. The uh, you know I'm going to get to this later, but Tampa has one of my. I'm from Connecticut, where I believe there is uh, one of the sneaky best airports in the country, and and Tampa is on my my list. I flew into Tampa this year. I said this airport's big time. It it's nice. I, I'm and and we actually moved on that side of the town because my two daughters were they were going to go to school. So by when wheels hit the ground, I can be at my house in 15 minutes. It's oh, all, that's it, great. And after spending all that time in Atlanta, no offense to Atlanta, it's been a, a welcome change. <laughs> yeah, that that airport can be a can be a challenge. Um, coach, obviously, times uh, times being what they are right now, the two biggest issues, not just in college basketball, but in the whole country are are the coronavirus and, and social injustice. We've done six episodes specifically on on social justice and and racial injustice is the way I should have phrased it initially. Um, and, and what I've done is make a commitment to ask everyone moving forward uh, what they're doing within their team to to address those issues, to talk to their guys about it, what that dialogue, um, you know, what that dialogue and, and the action items are in each program. But it's a great, great question. And, and, you know, we wouldn't be doing our jobs. I come from a family of educators. That's why I got into this uh, profession uh, and so forth. But I think initially um, it was some team meetings and some conversations with our players, uh, letting them uh, know that, you know, as coaches, we were here to, to listen, uh, to, to let them, you know, be angry and, uh, and different things like that. Uh, and then I really tried to, you know, open up those lines of communication, but also, you know, personally learn, really educate myself, um, give our guys opportunities to, to do some different things. We've taken part in some peaceful walks uh, here in the city of Tampa, uh, one that was led by one of our football players, a tremendous situation uh, uh, and, a, and a great day for the, the entire athletic department and the city of Tampa. Um, but, you know, one of the things that has that is, is, is really come through with our guys is, and I think Steve Kerr with the uh, Warriors said it the best, yeah. I believe that this is the generation that's going to make the changes that will be impactful and lasting. Um, they, they're, they're, they're very comfortable being able to talk about it and being able to have action regarding it. And I think it's been, for me as a head coach, I've learned as much from them as from any of the other areas that I'm, you know, trying to learn, learn and, and, and get a good grasp of, of how I can make a difference. And I think two things have really stood out. Um, one big difference between not being racist and saying I'm not racist and being anti-racist. Yeah. And that's a huge difference. And then, and to be honest with you, I never thought in those terms. Right. Um, and then I think the one thing I've learned really from our guys, um, is it, it, it's easy to see and and the the a racist act and to be able to determine that where where this generation has really got a hold of and, and got a firm grasp of is the systematic within yeah. the different systems you, you know uh, within the judicial system the healthcare system the education system all these it, it, it's just part of the fabric and mm -hmm. these. Uh, this generation is doing a great job of really pinpointing that and attacking that to make those changes. Um, and, you know, for, for, for me as a, as a head coach, just continuing opening up the conversation, had an unbelievable Zoom meeting with our parents of our mm. players, which I thought was really, really important. 
As yeah, that's well. interesting. Yeah, yeah and it, 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 went, it went extremely well. And, and um, you know, I just – I recruiting philosophy, re- philosophy regarding a program, I don't believe our players can ever reach their full potential as men or mm-hmm. as players or as students without – me having the parents involved in this process as well. Mm. And so to involve them in that, I thought uh, f- overall for our program was very impactful. Now, I, I may come back to that because I think that 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 is unique in and of itself and kind of the, you know, bringing parents parents in more of like trying to keep them out of out of the, the process just as far as the team goes. But as it as it relates to meeting with your team um, about this issue right now, as I talk to different coaches around the country, everyone's got, you know, their, their strategies and their action items right now. But one of the things I hear is that when we get back to campus, we'll be able to do A, B, and C. Um, you guys have a bit of an advantage now in that, in that you have most of your guys back on campus. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, we do. Almost and, everyone. And, and so as, as we, cause I, I think, how does that, what did that process look like in terms of preparing your guys, preparing your facility, preparing your, your equipment even to get those guys back on safely? Because I, I know these two items, you know, because of this, this unique period of time historically, they're connected. But I've also heard coaches um, articulate very eloquently the, the desire to get their kids back on campus, especially kids who don't come, who come from high risk areas, whether that's from the coronavirus or for other areas to get them back on campus because they know they're, they, not only they can get them safe, they can get them the resources they need. Um, and, and so if you could address that a little bit, just, just the logistics of getting them back on board and then the, and then the, the benefits of having them there right now. You know, and one of the things that we had, we probably had five or six of our guys that, that stayed right from the start. Oh, interesting. Uh, they, they they live in a, an apartment complex, four apartments in, in, with or four rooms within one apartment. Each player has their own room, their own bathroom, washer and dryer, the whole bit. Very self-contained. Very uh, the ability to to isolate if need be, and and not really have to go out into the common areas and so forth was beneficial. Um, obviously, all the classes went online. Uh, and, and different things like that. And with the computers, they were able to do a great job in school. Uh, but getting the guys back really put us in a position to, uh, one, get them tested. Uh, mm-hmm. The second thing was to keep educating them on what they need to do, the masks all the time. I put a, uh, We had a Zoom meeting, and we meet probably two or three times a week, sometimes just for five or ten minutes. But it, we, we put a graphic on there. What, what the percentage of, of the possibility of getting sick if you're wearing a mask, if someone else is wearing a mask and all that. And, and that was a really good educational piece for our guys to understand. Absolutely. Um, you know, and um, we have a protocol in place before they enter our facility, the Muma Basketball Complex. They, they get screened. They get tested. Um, they have to have their masks on. Uh, mm-hmm. When it comes to the voluntary workouts, we have a time frame where it's almost like a conveyor belt. They go into the practice gym and for 45 minutes, they're allowed to do any skill work that they want to do on their own. No more than four players in the gym at a time. Once that 45 minutes is done, we take 15 minutes and disinfect all the balls, all the all mm-hmm. the things that they've been using. Now they go into the weight room. Four guys in there at a time again no one ever touches a bar a dumbbell that someone else has touched they had their own equipment wow. that they're using during that 45 minutes again after they're done 15 minutes of disinfecting then they wow. go into the training room and do any prehab rehab stretching and so forth uh they're able to grab a, a meal on the way out they drop uh they're, they're, they have a, a big bin that they keep all their stuff in and that's disinfected every single night so we have a pretty good protocol in place. And at the same time, we understand that you can take all the precautions, um, but this thing is something that you have to battle every single day. Yeah, yeah. You know, Coach, as I, as I was preparing for this interview and, and looking into your background, your history, um, you've, you've been a head coach now at three different institutions, Dayton, 
Georgia Tech and now USF. But but prior to that, you were an assistant coach for for I mean quite a quite a group of Judd Heathcote, Tom Izzo, Kevin O'Neill, Stan Joplin. Um, so I got to ask, what, what's your, what's your best what's your best story? Uh, you know, whether it's I mean it can be Tom Izzo, but but it's probably going to be Kevin O'Neill. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> You, you know, as you said, Adam, I'm very, very blessed when it comes to this, you know, uh, to get a, a job as a graduate assistant at 22 years old, right out of college, being hired by Judd Heathcote. Uh, I'm 22, maybe 23. We have Steve Smith as our senior star, uh, wow. who is an unbelievable guy. We're still very close friends to, to this day. Um you know, and, and, and to work alongside, I'm one of the few guys that worked as an assistant with Coach Izzo and then right. worked for him as his assistant. Um, you know, I, I always remember when I got moved up at, at Michigan State from the GA to what was called back then, you remember this, the restricted earnings coach. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, Judd told me, he said, hey, hey, BG, there's no way you deserve this job. <laughs> Uh, there's no way I should give you this job, but I'm too old to interview anybody. And Izzo says just to give it to you. So that's how I got moved up at, at Michigan State. Um, and then, you know, obviously the times I spent with 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 Coach Izzo is is has has been unbelievable. Learned so much from him. Um, as you you remember back in the day, one of my main jobs was to drive. Coaches all around when he would go yeah. on a recruiting trip. I would drive. Oh, no. I couldn't go in the gym. Right. I would drive. He had his bag phone next to him. Uh, and I always remember that we were driving to Chicago to see um, Tom Kleinschmidt, great player that ended up going to DePaul. Uh, and we spent a six hour drive with Coach Izzo on the phone talking to Todd Lindemann, who was up in the UP. And about every 20 minutes, I had to pull to the side because coach was getting so upset with Lindemann's <laughs> high school coach uh, wearing and cussing and all everything because Lindemann was going to go to Indiana to play for Coach Knight. We get to Chicago. Tom sees uh, Klein Schmidt play, loves him. By the time we get back, he had commits he commits to DePaul. So that was a rough 12-hour time with Coach Izzo. I can tell you that right now. And you didn't get to go into the game. You, you were just waiting yeah. in the car. I sat in the car, the Chevrolet Lumina. I always, you know, and, uh, yep, it was, you know, because a little bit of a weather, so it's about a four-and-a-half-hour drive. But it was six hours there, six hours back, and Coach Izzo was on the bag phone the entire 12 hours. How about that? How about that? And then the – all right, so I know you you, you kind of dodged it there, but yeah. the, the best best Kevin O'Neill, best Kevin O'Neill. And that was at Northwestern, right, when you yeah. worked there? You know, you, you know, I always say this. It, 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 as good a coach as I've ever been around, and I think everybody mm. can attest to that, basketball-wise, X and O's-wise, relationship-wise, all that. Um, I worked for him for two years at Northwestern. And I always equate it to dog years. It took 14 years off my life. Um, but it was a, a two-year span of unbelievable growth and learning for me as a, as a, as a basketball coach. But he was incredible. Um, he, he, our, our first practice um, together um, had some things going on a little bit. And, and he showed up right before practice started. And it was a Saturday morning, first practice, 8 a.m. practice. I call him up because he's not there yet. And he's like, don't worry, BG, I'll, I'll be there. I said, you got the practice plan? He goes, I got the practice plan. He came in five minutes before practice started. We went four straight hours, 8 to 12. <laughs> it was as an efficient and as a good a practice as I've ever seen. I always say it was four-hour practice three hours and 45 minutes of defense, and then 15 minutes of feeding the ball into Eschmeyer in the post. So that's all we did, you know. And uh, I get done with that, those four hours, and uh, I was, like, you know, blown away, just blown away because he was – it just coaching was innate. It's just what he mm -hmm. was, you know what I yeah. mean? And, yeah. and I, we just – we had a great staff. We had Bob Byer on that staff who's an assistant in the NBA. Billy Schmidt, who's an assistant in the NBA. Uh, I learned so much in those two years, Adam. It was incredible.
I, I believe it. I believe it. Now you had a, a heck of a playing career of your own. Um, <laughs> did he, did a year at, at the Naval Academy played next to David Robinson, right? On the yep. lead eight team. Yep. And then transferred uh, and ended up uh, following in your, your parents' uh, footsteps and in, in studying secondary education at, at Oakland, playing three years there. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. So I guess first and foremost, is there, um, you know, is David Robinson the, the pinnacle of, you know, everything he looks from the outside looking in, just the pinnacle of professionalism and, and maturity even at that young age? He, he, he was. And, and uh, Adam, it was the first time I ever really I mean, I played on a couple great high school teams. But at that level, to see the, the, the obviously there's a commitment that everybody has at that at that place. But mm-hmm. what an unbelievable team I was part of. Um, Doug Wojcik was a starting point guard. Mm-hmm. Uh, David, wow. David Robinson was a junior. Our senior Vernon Butler, whose son's a great player at Drexel. Um, you know, was, you know, Vernon graduates as the all-time leading scorer and all-time leading rebounder at Navy. The next year, David breaks all those records. But we had Kyler Whitaker and 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 Cliff Reese, who's a great high school coach in the, in the D.C. area right now. We had a heck of a team and just really good guys that, that really, really, uh, you saw the sacrifice for the team every single, every single game and, and every single day. And the one thing that goes unnoticed – we had, Paul Evans was our coach. Mm. And, uh, man, he was a, I mean, just a dynamic, fantastic coach. He actually lives here in the St. Pete area, not too far from Tampa, comes to uh, some of our games during the year. So that's good to have him around. Um, but David Robinson was a, a, a pro way before he was a pro. And uh, just ungodly talented, could stand at seven foot, could stand still and do a, Standing backflip at seven wow. foot. Yeah, I've never wow. seen anything like it. Now, and I've I don't want to assume that any any quote I read was was accurate, but I, I did read uh something and, and this is me paraphrasing it a little bit, but say there are very few days that you have still that you don't draw upon lessons you learned learned that year. Is that an accurate sentiment at least, if not a direct quote? Yeah, that is that is every single day. Uh that year was you know tremendous for me as a young man. Um, you know, there's still days, Adam, I'll be honest. I think back and say, you know what? I should have stuck it out another year just to really give it. Yeah. I probably gave up on it a little too early and it it was basketball related. I really wanted to play. I didn't get to play much, Mm -hmm. but you know, the academic piece, I knew that I wanted to get into some leadership role more on the educational side. And at Navy, it's really math and engineering, you know, to be honest with you. Um, but, uh, the, 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 the yep. stuff you learn there and the, the honor and the and the um, just the inherent uh, things. You, know, you do things the right way all the time. I became when I transferred to Oakland, I ended up being a, you know, a, a much better student, an academic All-American. And that was all because of the stuff I learned as as a as a freshman and from my organization today to how I handle things with my players, with my staff and all that a lot of that is is based on the, what i learned during that first year now i know i'm i'm jumping around and, and not going in chronological order that is uh that's kind of sometimes how i tend to be but uh as i said you you've been a head coach at, at three different institutions now you took over a dayton program you 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 brought it to new levels uh you went to georgia tech you spent five years there we're have we're poised to have arguably um well, maybe not arguably, maybe it's pretty clear, your best team yet, um, and then took over at, at uh, USF. What have there been, have there been major takeaways from, from each, each stop? Or is there, you know, is there any kind of overwhelming lesson that, that each place offered? Yeah, you know, I, I think one is, is I've grown and and matured as a coach and as a man and in, in, in all those all those places and they're all remarkably different um you know very fortunate for ted kissel the ad at at at, at dayton to hire me um you know as a as a younger assistant to take over a program that had really really been on the upswing under mm-hmm. coach uh Oliver Purnell, and he did a great job of building that thing back up. And he, gave, he left me with a tremendous team. Now, 
we had to kind of build it back up after that. But, um, you know, the, the one thing I always take away from Dayton, just the passion that those people have there. You People can talk about it, but you feel it every single every single day. Um, and, and Dayton, if, I, if I could jump in before you get to Georgia Tech, the Dayton program to me, as I as I look and this is just a, a outside looking in impression when I when I look at your coaching, um, you know, your, your teams, it, 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 it looks from the outside looking in as if you don't skip steps every year. There's a progression and there seems to be a correlation there between the Dayton program and your personal style, because it, it seems like that program every different coach they have just takes it to a to another level and, and and you made that point to me before we started recording i don't want to take credit for that but yeah. you were you were pointing that out so I, i'd love for to hear your thoughts on that you know I, I i think there's an infrastructure there at the university of dayton that creates that and they've made you know really good hires too and 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 they they've invested into that into that program every coach that takes over gets a little more of an investment yeah. uh you know Oliver did a tremendous job. Uh, and then when we took over, one of the things that we said we wanted to try to do is we, when we get to the NCAA tournament, when we get to the postseason, we want to win in that. In that, mm -hmm. And we were able to do that first NCAA win in 20 years. We went win the NIT. Uh, we also, because of the importance in the recruiting, wanted to make sure that we were able to get some guys into the NBA. And we mm -hmm. had three guys uh in a seven year recruiting span play s significant years in the in the nba uh and then when when archie miller took over he took it to another level you know more wins in the in the in the postseason and i think anthony grant is going to do the same the same thing and and a little bit of it is you just keep building you know mm. you keep building and, and you build on that success and you don't um the, the coaches, Archie Miller is a great example. Anthony Grant's great. They, those aren't guys that rest on the laurels of what's happened in the past. Those guys who are driven and are going to continue to move the program forward. And I think in terms of hiring, that's the one thing that they, they've they been able to do is hire guys that are hungry to understand where the program's at, but with the desire and with the technical skills and personality to move it forward. They also don't seem to be threatened by the success of the past either. I think, you know, it was unique for, I think, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but you went back with your USF team and practiced there recently. Right. And, you know, Anthony Grant's not threatened by Archie's success. Archie wasn't. So it, it seems to be this, you know, so the program there seems to be uh, impressive in that, you know, there's there's still buy-in from people who were there over a decade ago in this this common sense of uh, of collaboration almost. Yeah, and Adam, you bring up a great point because you see that in some other programs. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's usually when guys like at, at Xavier where an assistant took over mm -hmm. and had mm -hmm. been part of it. Dayton is the only one, you know, Gonzaga, where Mark Few takes over from, from months. You know what I mean? Um, Dayton's the only one that – has gone outside the family, but has still kept that family and that yeah. connectedness amongst next coach by next coach by next coach. That's interesting. Now, and then you go to Georgia Tech, and it's and it's a it's a rebuild. That's that's mm -hmm. fair to say. And again, it's it's the kind of one step at a time mentality, and that's that's the way I'm deeming it. Is that the way when you approach a job? Is that I mean, it just seems like you're not an advocate of st uh, skipping steps. Pardon me. Um, and, and I'm not sure if that's fair to say, cause that's just my observation, but uh, I was wondering if that is, is an inherent part of the philosophy. Yeah, it, it is because I'm, I'm just a true believer that so much in when you're rebuilding and a lot of times rebuilding is done for, for a lot of different reasons at Georgia tech. The reason it was is because, uh, Paul Hewitt did such a great job of re recruiting and all these great players. And a lot of them left before anybody thought they were going to leave, they were going to mm -hmm. leave. You know, now it puts your program, especially in that league, in a t in a very difficult spot. Um, you know, for 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 me, the, the thing with rebuilding and when you're trying to build a program, so much of it occurs below the surface to start the, mm -hmm. the cultural piece. And everybody talks about culture, but the cultural piece, the work ethic piece, the academic piece, especially at a place like Georgia Tech, you got to get the academics solidified. So from 3.30 to 6.30, the guys aren't all worried about if they're going to be eligible or not. 
And that's right. a piece that, you know, at different places you got to worry about there. That's a, that's a big piece. The other thing is, you know, are they getting their butts kicked from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m.? What do you really have it at 3.30 to, to right. practice? And so now you got to, you got to maneuver that as well. But I'm just, you know, I take great pride in the fact that we built things the right way. And I take great pride in the fact that, that um, culturally when, when, if we move on, be it, on our own decision like Dayton or be it someone else's decision like at Georgia Tech, that program is really solid and in place for the next guy. Uh, you know, because I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's different. I'm not one of those guys that hopes this team loses all the time or anything like that because right. I just don't think that benefits, that that puts me in jail as much as anybody else. So, you know, um, having that place in a, in a solid position was something that, you know, I take great pride in, in the type of guys that we have in there, but if you skip steps, it's going to come back to get you. It just always is. Well, that's why I raised that because it seems like that pattern that we alluded to at Dayton of kind of, you know, one guy taking it to the next level. It seems like that's something that you brought to Georgia tech and, and, um, even, you know, and obviously there that didn't have the ending that, that you wanted or probably even deserved, um, but that the program was was better off for it. And so I wanted to ask you about about if I could about that experience, because everybody, you know, it's it's one thing to listen to this and, and you know, everybody gets excited every year. I, well, I shouldn't say everybody. I think fans get excited every year about the coaching carousel and, and what it means. Um you know, I learned my first year as a division one assistant, we were fired. You know, I think the the press release said we resigned. That was just false. Um, you know, so I, but I, it's always, you know, the stories that aren't told are the, the stories of, of the families. I know you have a wife and two daughters sometimes. And then the reactions uh, that the coaches have, you know, kind of introspectively, what, what are they um, you know, what do they do with that? So I, I did, if I, if you'd allow me to ask you about that experience of, of, you know, how it ended at Georgia tech and, and what that was like for both you personally with regard to your family, but also you professionally. Yeah. And it's a great question. Um, and, and, you know, you, you, you have to, you know, I have a strong faith and, and that, that was in, in, important, but the, the, the biggest thing I learned from it was I was hired by, by an AD um, who after, you know, after a year and a half left and took another job, that's always going to put you in a tough spot. If you're always a warning sign yeah. Yeah, when you're in a, in a, in a rebuilding situation. Um, but uh, the one thing, Adam, that, that I really learned, we had our best year, our last year. Now we mm -hmm. had a good team and we had some good young players and we had a good recruiting class coming in that next year. But the reason I think we did is because um, I knew that we were, you know, you know, on the hot seat, so to speak. And I yep. just made it, uh, you know, a, a, a rallying cry with my staff and with the team that we were not going to worry about that. We mm -hmm. were going to have a great year because we were going to have great practice. We were going to be a great practice team, which put us in position to play better in games. And we weren't going to worry about the outside distractions. I'll be honest. It was probably times in year three and four, where I, as a coach, I worried more about keeping my job than, than doing the job. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of guys go through that. Yeah. And the one thing in, in year five, we didn't do that. We coached mm -hmm. our butt off every day. We had an unbelievable group of guys. My first recruiting class led by Marcus George's hunt was a senior. We added some pieces, um, you know, and, and we had a great year, 23 wins, I think. And, and, um, the decision was made well prior to that, that they were going to, sure. they were going to make a move. And, and, you know, uh, I was disappointed because I felt that we had some really good players coming back. We had a kid named Joshua Koji coming in. We had Romella white coming in. We had a chance to be very, very good in the, in the coming years. But, um, you know, you, you just have to truly believe that sometimes the, the thing that looks like the biggest setback is just a setup for something better. And I just, you know, went with that and used that next year to get better as a coach, to kind of get rejuvenated and to really pinpoint some things that were going to be important if I ever got fortunate enough to get another job. 
So that brings us to uh, to where we are now, uh, South Florida. And one of the things that that I find interesting is, you know, you, you started a job like Dayton, which has the reputation of being a, a quote unquote good job, but with you know that reputation comes expectations. Um, South Florida is a program that candidly has often not associated with that label. People would label it a tough job, mm -hmm. um, and with that comes the inverse expectations. So you're again unique in that you've you've experienced different types of, of jobs. I'm wondering if there's one that that you prefer. Is there one that that fits your personality better? Are there misconceptions about about those those labels? Yeah, you you know, and it, it, you know, as we were talking, I never really thought of that. You you, you know. Um, you know, I, I handled, I thought my staff and myself and our players handled those expectations well at Dayton. As I said, I knew we had a really good team that first year. And we start off, we go to Maui. We're the first non-BCS school to ever win the Maui tournament. Um, I think we started off 11-0 and 0 before we went to Cincinnati. And Coach Huggins and that crew kicked the living crap out of us. Um, but, you know, uh, the the, the – the idea of those expectations, it, I was coming from Michigan State. That was like normal. Right. You, you, right. you know what I mean? And But yeah. I do think, Adam, I do remember like looking back and, and saying, well, we're playing this team. No big deal. This is as a head coach at Dayton. Yeah. Now I'd be like, you, you know, because I didn't know any better. Right. <laughs> yeah, I just thought right. we were going to win every game. That's yeah. what we did for four years at, at Michigan State when I came back. You know, we won. It just kept winning. And. And then we start off 11 and 0 at Dayton. I just said, Hey, this is kind of easy. Well, it's a, it's a lot harder than that, you know? Yeah. Um, but you know, the, the one thing here about South Florida, I saw some, some great things in place. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that we've had trouble sustaining any type of success is we've been in, you know, it's an exaggeration, but 32 different leagues over the last 30 years. I mean, every right. time we, we we're switching leagues, I think we have, a solid footing in the American now, which is going to help us in recruiting um, and so forth. Um, but there's a lot of good things here in, in, in place, the facility, the academic piece, the league, the, 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 where we're located and different things like that. Sometimes a job just needs somebody that really believes in it and is, is looking at it as their opportunity to turn things around and be part of that. And that's the way I feel about South Florida. And, and I think that's why we've been able to make strides maybe a little quicker than even I expected. South Florida is uh, historically, it seems like this is now a program that, that, that almost has an identity or, or a brand and that people know what to expect from, from your teams. They know you want hard playing guys, you're going to defend, you're going to rebound and, and you're going to be, you know, physically and mentally competitive. Is, is, is that a fair, um, characterization? And is there any part of that, that, that maybe, you know, people, people might miss, is there subtlety that, that goes unnoticed beyond that? No, I think, I, I think when we took over one of the things we knew because of everything you said previous was, was correct. We were coming off four straight single win seasons, mm -hmm. you know, uh, NCAA violations, some, some very embarrassing things that have ha had happened in the program. So one of the things that we said is we need to recruit some tough kids that are going to be able to fight through some really tough, tough times. And our first recruiting class now are, are entering their, their senior year. Uh, but the, the, the one thing, obviously the defense and the rebounding and the toughness, you know, maybe not always at the same level, but that's something that has always been important uh, to me. Sometimes um, it's just, it, it. you know, someone asked me in year two when we were actually won 24 games and someone said, you know, you're just not a very good free throw shooting team. <laughs> and, and I said, I'm going to be honest with you. The last thing I worried about in terms of putting together a team that can compete was if they could make free throws or not. Because right. that was way down the list, you know. Yeah, sure. That, that was way down the list, but there's, there's never a shortage of coaching experts in the world. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I just right. said, listen, we we needed to find the toughest, hardest playing dudes that we could get. Right. Because that was how we were going to build our brand and how we were going to have people 
watching us say, you know what, this team is worth supporting and coming to and being part of. And I could see guys improving and getting better and so forth. But Adam, now not that's the challenge now, you know, to, to still play with that same energy and toughness, to still rebound like we, we have, to, to defend like we have. But for us to take another step, we have to become, you know, uh, much better in those efficiency areas, the offensive efficiency areas. And that's going to be the challenge for us because to take another step, that's where you have to get to. You know, like Kelvin Sampson at Houston, they they still rebound and play tough D, but when right. – the reason they won more games than any school in the state of Texas over the last five years or four years is because offensively they've been able to mix enough in with what they do on the other end of the court. Yeah, absolutely. The um, they're spending more than the they're they're doing more than just throwing inside Northwestern style. A little, right, little. right, right, right. <laughs> the uh, I I want to be respectful of of your time here. There's I have a couple of quick hitter questions that I, I usually like to ask uh, everybody. Um, the it, first of all, I don't know if you're a big reader, but I, I like to ask coaches if there's a, a book whether they currently read, whether they've read over the years that that has really resonated. Um, I, I do give the uh, the pivot option of of picking a, a movie, a documentary, or a podcast. Just Something to give, uh, you know, the fans out there an idea of, you know, when you're not in the basketball floor, when you're not with your, your wife and daughters, um, you know, what, what you may be diving into. Well, you, you know, again, it, it, very rarely am I reading a book just for pure pleasure. Usually sure. it has something to do with me to be, become a better father, husband, coach. And it's interesting, my, my, our family was in during the season and I have a bookshelf here in my office and, and my wife's sister said to me, she said, BG, you don't have any like coaching books on, mm -hmm. your, on your shelf. And it's usually John Gordon. It's Max Licato. It's Joel Osteen. It's uh, 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 John Len wait, Lencioni. Uh, okay. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's those type of those type of books that, you know, the one thing that those do, they get you thinking. Right. And, and right. it doesn't necessarily mean you're thinking about just the topics they're talking about. It just causes your mind to think and to grow and to think outside the box and to, you know, come up with different things that, you know what, that makes sense. That The latest book that I just read was uh, Jimmy Dykes' book that he, that he has out. Really, really, really high level book. It was good. And it was, it was hard to read because mm. it challenged you. You, yeah. you know, I, there was a lot of times I, I put the book down and said, I need 15 minutes of thinking about what he just asked in the book rather than, than reading it. But, um, but I'm still, I'm a guy's guy too. You know, when, when the time comes, I'll put the book down and watch my Ray Donovan and billions <laughs> and, and Homeland too. Those are my I, billions is the, uh, I know, you know, Jeff Goodman's a, a friend and I know he just did this, this thing where he asked everybody about their show, but man, billions comes up a lot. And when I ask this question, it, 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 it it's, it's, it's the muchismo in, in, in all the guys, you know. And, and I'm at, like, I'm with you. I love it. Sunday nights, don't call, yeah. you know. There's I mean, two like, guys that are so stubborn right? that they just won't let it go, and it just keeps coming back to haunt them. And I think, you know, just like you, you just like watch watching these two guys go at it and just say, why are you doing what you're doing, you know. We were, you know, it's funny. My wife and I watch it together. We sat down on Sunday to turn it on, and we both – and we and we both – you know, and I can and it's, it's the break. You know, we forgot it's the mid-season break. Uh, all right, last last question I got you before I go off on Bobby Axelrod here. Um, the everybody I talk to, assistants say he's his energy is constant, attention to detail is constant. Is that uh, is that natural or is that I mean, what do you do? I mean, are you, is that just a natural gift? Because I know some people who who have that gift, or or is there is there something you do to harness that? No, you, you know, I, I think one thing is um, as a coach, I, I'm not n naturally maybe positive. I think that's okay. something you got to work on. You got you okay. to work on that. And I've dramatically gotten better with that. That doesn't mean I don't coach hard. That doesn't mean I'm not honest and critique the players. But there is an energy. And I'll tell you one thing, Adam, this has been one of the biggest challenges right now for me. Because the spring and summer is my favorite time of the year as a coach. 
Hmm. For four hours a day, an hour at a time, I'm in the gym with two or three of our players. Just hmm. us, me and them working on their game. You're and, doing that yourself. Yeah. And, and you know, yeah. my staff's in there with me, but I'm out, I'm out, and I love it. That's my hmm. favorite time of the year um, because there's no pressure of a win or a loss. Uh, you know, there's I'm not meeting with the boosters before or afterwards. It's just coaching and helping a guy become his very best. Hmm. And I, I've missed that. That, yeah. is, that has hurt me, my psyche over, over this time, because it's something that is just a great release and you just feel good, uh, you know, at the end of that. Um, but the, the, the energy piece, the organizational piece, um, the, the, the piece of, of, you know, trying to build within my staff and within my guys. Um, I just, you know, I know it sounds, you know, cliche, but, I just believe if we can get our guys to become the men we all want them to be, you coached. If you can do that, you're going to win a lot of games. You got to win. Yeah. You're going to win a lot of games. And some people don't want to hear it that my, the number one thing isn't win, 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 win. But that's a byproduct of all the other stuff that that you do. And I just, you know, for me, it, it's my father was in education, as you mentioned earlier. My mother was a nurse that worked with. Uh, pregnant women that were addicted to crack cocaine. I was going to say she did counseling too, right? Yeah, she did the counseling yeah. uh, to try to clean them up and have healthy. I've seen wow. my whole life the two people I love and respect the most impact other people's lives in a positive way. And I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. I'm just lucky enough to use basketball as a vehicle to do that. Well, that is a, uh, a perfect way to cap this. Coach, thank you so much for your time. We, we really appreciate it. And uh, we'll uh, be excited once Sunday nights get back going again. You got it. Thanks, Ann. All right. Thank you.